Welcome, everyone. Happy you're here. If you will stand to your feet, we're gonna worship together, right? Let's sing, Oh Lord, my God. Oh Lord, my God. When I in awesome wonder consider Thy hands have made. I see the stars. I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe displays. Come on. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art. How great Thou art. Then sings my Christ shall come, when Christ shall come, we shall live acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart, then I shall Thank you for his goodness, amen. Come on. There's a girl in the corner. 
she stands there with her head lowered and not a sound. She is thin and hungry. She works there all day. She is the broken one. She dreams of better days with family she hasn't seen in years. She is the one you pass daily. And as you judge, she has but one person in her life. He is around the corner watching and waiting on her wages. But what you don't know, she is a warrior and a fighter. She will come across the battle of her life, stay and for sure die or run and live. So don't judge or just pass her by. Show her love for she fights every day to survive. How do I know? I am a survivor and I was the girl in the corner. What's up, 10 o'clock? It's so glad to, or I'm so glad that you're here today with us. If I have not had the pleasure of meeting you, my name is Dalen. I'm one of the ministers in training here at The Experience. As you guys saw in the video, our highlight for the month is Ancora, Tennessee. They are an amazing organization that supports the survivors of human trafficking. If you would like more information about their organizations or want to figure out ways that you can help or get involved, they have a table set up in the foyer. Stop by. They would love to talk to you. I also want to take this opportunity to say thank you to everyone who came out to our worship night Friday. It was amazing. Thank you to everyone who purchased merch. We raised $50,000. That's going straight to Ancora. So on behalf of our church, thank you. Next. If it is your first time at the church, I just want to say welcome. We're so glad that you're here, and we want to get to know you better. The best way we can do this is for you to fill out a connection card. You can do this one of two ways. You can fill out a digital copy on our Experience Community Church app. You can also fill out a physical copy. Just reach into the seat back pocket right in front of you, fill out that card, hand it to someone at the connections corner, and we will be in contact with you this week. Next. If it is your first time at the church or your 100th time at the church and you have not attended a next class, that is your next step. We have one coming up on Monday, May 13th at 6.30 p.m. You get to come on out. Pastor Josh is going to share his testimony. Um, you'll get to hear about the history, mission, vision of the church. You'll get a tour of the building, get to meet all of our staff, and you'll get to ask literally any question that you may have. We're going to have pizza for you guys. Child care will be available. The only thing that we ask is if you are planning on coming, sign up on our app or website so that we know how many people to expect next. All right. As followers of Jesus, we are called to serve others. One of the ways we do that here at The Experience is through our annual community cleaning day, which is right around the corner. It's coming up on Saturday, May 4th from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. If you have never been a part of one of these, it's an amazing opportunity for us to go out and love on our community. This year, we're asking that you team up with your life groups, serve your neighborhoods around where you live, but we will also have a team here at the church where we're going to serve the neighborhoods around this building. If you would like more information or want to sign up, you can visit the Connections Corner Corner, or you can sign up on our app or website. Next. Another super exciting thing we have coming up is our baptism services. Um, these are going to be happening on May 18th and 19th. So if you have not been baptized, this is an opportunity for you to take your next step when you're in your relationship with Jesus. If you have been baptized, this is still a service for you. As Christ followers, we want to come together and celebrate the kingdom of God growing. We also want to support those individuals who are taking their next step. So come on out. It's going to be amazing baptism week and is one of my favorite things that we do here at the church. I have also been told to tell you guys to please, please, please check out our Lost and Found. It is on the bench out there in the foyer by the main doors. Um, everything that is not claimed by the end of today is going to be donated. So get your stuff next. All right, last, I just want to say thank you to all of you who faithfully tithe. It is because of your obedience to God through giving that we are able to do things like go serve our community and support amazing nonprofits like Encora, Tennessee. So if you feel led to give, you can do so in any of the ways that you see on the screen. If you guys will stand with me, I'm going to pray, and then we will jump back into worship. Father God, 
thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you so much that you love us and offer us peace and comfort through every single season of our lives, Lord. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity and the space and the building to come here and gather and worship your name. Um, please let us all come in here with open hearts, open minds, ready to receive whatever it is that you have for us. Lord, let's not, let us not only receive it, but go out and implement it into our daily lives. Let us leave here changed. Let us leave here ready to go out and be the people that you've called us to be, to do the things that you've called us to do. Keep, ev or keep your hand on every single person in this room, Lord. It's in your son's holy and matchless name that we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Then come thou found together. Then come thou found of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me sin, melodious song, and sung by flaming tongues of birth. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, a mount of thy redeeming love. Oh, praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it. Mount of thy redeeming love. Oh, to grace. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness like a feather bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Oh, here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Oh, that day when freed from sinning, I shall see thy lovely face. Clothed in blood washed linen, how I'll see thy sovereign grace. Come, my Lord, no longer tarry. Take my ransom soul away. Send thine angels now to carry me to realms of endless day. Oh, send thine angels now to Come thou found one more time together. Come thou found of every
came to the world you created Trading your crown for a cross You willingly died Your innocent life paid the cost Counting your status is nothing The king of all kings came to serve Washing my feet Covering me with your love Come on, lift more of you If more of you Means less of me Take everything Yes, all of you Is all I need Take everything You are my life and my treasure The one that I can't live without here at your feet, my desires and dreams I lay down. Come on, sing that again together. Oh, here at your feet, my desires and dreams I lay down. Oh, if more of you means less of me, but take everything. Yes, all of Take everything If more of you means less for me Take everything Yes, all of you is all I need Take everything Oh, Lord Change me like only Time, let that be our prayer together. If more of you, yes, all of you, oh 
All my words will soon I got nothing new How could I express All my gratitude I could sing these songs As I often do But every song must end And you never do So I throw in my hands To praise And I know it's not much Except for a heart singing Hallelujah Hallelujah I've got one response I've got just one move With my arms stretched wide I will worship you all So I throw my hands And praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, let's lift our voice and sing this next part out together. Oh, come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. time together. So I throw in my hands to praise you again and again. Cause all that
There's a, a, a chorus of a song that's been heavy on my heart this weekend, and I'm gonna teach it to y'all. It's very simple. Here's how it goes. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things, and to you are all things. You deserve the glory. That's it. You are worthy of it all. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things. And to you are all things. You deserve the glory. Let's sing that together. You are worthy of it all. God, you are more than deserving of all of the praise, of all of the worship that we bring, not just in the times that we sing these songs, not just in the time that we're playing music, but in everything that we do. Because worship is about having our hearts postured in a way that seeks to honor your name. So through the way that we serve our family, or the way we serve our community, the way we work at our jobs, the way we love on others. Lord, let it glorify and lift up your name. And for the word that is brought by Pastor Josh, as you speak through him, that it's your words being spoken to us. It's your truth. And so I pray that we understand what you're teaching us that we apply it to our lives, that we allow you to mold us, change us, and help us look more like Jesus. All in a way that gives you the honor and the glory that you deserve. Lord, we love you, we honor you, and we thank you. It's in your precious and your holy name that we pray. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Y'all may be seated.
Good morning. There you are. Hey, good to see you. You look beautiful. You do. I just be nice. Uh, if you have a Bible, I hope you do. Second Corinthians is where we are this morning. Second Corinthians chapter two. So glad you're with us this morning. Uh, I'm assuming some of you came out to worship night Friday night. <laughs> yeah, that was an unbelievable night. If you did get a chance to come out, we came together with all of our campuses at the Murphy Center at MTSU Friday night. And man, just had a night. I, I don't even have words to describe how beautiful it is to hear a couple of thousand people all together joining in and singing praises to the name Jesus. It was unbelievable. My, my favorite part of the night, though, is um, Kyle, our worship pastor, he got on the keyboard and he, he took us back to some deep cuts from like the late 90s. You guys remember that? Yeah, there's a part of me that was... Yeah, and, and it's funny, he asked everybody there, because it's a college, you know, how many of you, you weren't born in 1999, and like half of the arena's hands went up, and I was like, hey, I feel targeted by that. Um, but man, it was incredible, it was awesome. We were able to raise a bunch of money for Ancora, and if you haven't got a chance to go check out what they're doing, they've got a table set up in the lobby this morning, so go by and uh, sign up to be a part of their, uh, their, their prayer ministry. They're looking for prayer partners just to, to pray for them and support the work they're doing, because man, that's a... Uh, they're doing some really important work rescuing uh, women out of that um, human trafficking. So they need a lot of prayer for that. So glad you're with us this morning. We are in the middle of our study in the book of 2 Corinthians. If you weren't with us last week, we began talking about what this book of the Bible is. It's a letter written from the Apostle Paul to a group of believers at a place called Corinth. <clears throat> and there was a lot of tension and a lot of conflict in Paul's relationship with these believers. And so in the first chapter, Paul writes this letter really as a letter of reconciliation to reach out and to uh, really clear the air and just make sure everybody's okay and, and really um, reaffirm his credibility in their eyes. And so chapter one is all about just the comfort that God gives us when we suffer. Because as we follow Jesus, we're gonna go through hard times and hardship, but God comforts us with his grace so that we can be comfort to other people who are going through suffering. And, and so as we get into chapter two, Paul's really gonna get into the meat for why he's writing this letter. And here is what he's going to be getting at in chapter two. He's going to urge with very strong words these believers to be obedient in extending forgiveness and reconciliation. And I think it's very important that we keep in mind the word obedient when we think about the word forgiveness. Because you know why? For many of us as Christians, we don't think forgiveness is a matter of obedience. We see forgiveness as a matter of emotion. But the truth is, as we get into the word of God this morning we're gonna find that forgiveness is just as much a matter of obedience to the commands of Jesus as anything else that Jesus commanded. And so Paul's gonna urge these believers that they are to extend forgiveness. They are to pursue reconciliation, reminding them of the importance of love and unity. But more than that, like Christ has won the victory in our lives. And if we're going to live from the victory that Christ has won for us, we have to be willing to extend the same kind of reconciliation and forgiveness that Christ has won for us. So let me say this before we get going this morning. Um, this is a very simple chapter in terms of understanding its meaning. But how many of you know it's chapters like that that are the most dangerous for us to read? Because when you know what it says, you have no excuse for why you're not doing it. You follow me this morning? So the ones that are easy to understand are most of the time the ones that are the most difficult to obey. But for every one of us in this room, this isn't a matter of, I feel like forgiving this person. This isn't a matter of, maybe I'll get the right kind of emotion and then the kind of positive sentiment overload. I'll say, well, you know, they have more redeeming qualities than bad. I guess I'll forgive them. No, 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 no. It's a matter of, will you be obedient to the commands of Jesus? Or will you say, I'm gonna follow what I want in this situation? And this is where the rubber meets the road and Christianity becomes at times a very difficult thing, but a very rewarding and blessed thing nonetheless. So we need the Lord's grace this morning, amen? Two of you think we do, the rest of you are like, no, I'll do it in my own strength, we're good, no. <laughs> Let's go to the Lord. Father, we do need your grace this morning. We can't do this in our own strength. We can't forgive those who wrong us. We can't pursue reconciliation in tense and painful situations unless 
your spirit is the one giving us the strength to do so. And so this morning, we wanna ask for your Holy Spirit to guide us and lead us and show us what this text looks like applied to our lives. Lord, for some of us, we're right in the middle of very tense and painful situations. For some of us, we're right in the middle of conflict and tension in relationships. And God, this is a timely word for us this morning to be in this passage of scripture. And so I pray, God, that it wouldn't be enough for us just to hear it with our ears and then leave this place the exact same way we came in. I pray our hearts this morning would be set on obeying what it is you have spoken through your word. Lord, we pray for every church in Cannon County, Tennessee. We thank you for the many wonderful churches in our community. We pray, Lord, for your blessing on each and every one of them. Help us to be united under one name, the name Jesus. Be with us now as we study your word, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. Look, if you will, at uh, verse one of chapter two. Paul writes this. In fact, I made up my mind about this. I would not come to you on another painful visit. For if I cause you pain, then who will cheer me other than the one being hurt by me? I wrote this very thing so that when I came, I wouldn't have pain from those who ought to give me joy because I am confident about all of you that my joy will also be yours. For I wrote to you with many tears out of an extremely troubled and anguished heart not to cause you pain, but that you should know the abundant love I have for you. So what's the context? Well, if you remember from chapter one, Paul had been criticized by some people in this church because he changed his travel plans. And so the accusation being levied against Paul is that because Paul had changed his travel plans, he'd not kept his promises. He's being accused of being fickle. He's being accused of being untrustworthy, unreliable. There's been a misunderstanding that has happened between these believers. And here's what happened. The Corinthian believers had responded by assuming the worst of Paul. How many of you know misunderstandings are gonna happen in relationships? They're gonna happen in your marriage. They're gonna happen in your family. And shocking, I know, they're gonna happen within the church. And how we respond to those misunderstandings is very important. What we can do, unfortunately, is we can respond by assuming the worst of other people. Assuming to know their motives when maybe we don't. Assuming to know the full story when maybe we don't. And anytime we do that, it can be really, really hard to try to restore that trust that's been broken because we jump to a conclusion that might have been unfair for us to jump to. So Paul is clarifying the real reason for why he hadn't paid the Corinthian church a second visit. And he says in verse one and two, it's because he wanted to preserve their relationship. Apparently his most recent visit to Corinth had been a painful visit. It had caused them a lot of pain because of confrontation and conflict and some really, really tough conversations. And so Paul writes, man, if I came to Corinth, to Corinth again, uh, my presence might cause you even more pain. And if my presence causes you more pain, then who's gonna cheer me? In other words, I need you guys in my life. I need the encouragement, I need the cheer, I need the support from you guys. And if he came to Corinth again, that could have greatly harmed their relationship. And so what does Paul decide to do? Instead of paying them another visit, he's gonna write them a letter as he considers all the complex dynamics and issues with Corinth, he decides the wisest thing to do in order to communicate what needs to be said is to write them a letter. Now, there's a number of reasons for that. Perhaps it's because he sees that saying everything needs to be said and having it on a piece of paper that they can read and they can think about and they can reread, maybe that's the best way to keep people from misconstruing his words. Maybe he thinks I can say what really needs to be said without getting so emotional. I say things I don't need to say. For whatever reason though, Paul writes to them in this way, apparently about some very, very serious things. He, he says that he wrote from an extremely troubled and anguished heart. He didn't do it to cause them pain, but he had some very tough things to say, correction and confrontation. And he did it out of tears and a broken heart, but he did it from a place of love, that love always speaks the truth. And sometimes truth is not easy to hear, but it's what we need to hear nonetheless. There's a proverb that says a timely word, or some translations say a word in season 
how good that is. You heard me say this last week and it's still true, but it's that communication is the right message to the right people at the right time in the right way. And if any of those things are off, it can change the meaning of what you're trying to communicate entirely. Like you can have the, the right words, but man, you said it to the wrong person. You drew somebody into that conflict that didn't need to be drawn into that conflict. Maybe you had the right words, but you said it at the wrong time, right? That 2 a.m. is probably not the time to roll over and say to your spouse, we need to talk about this now. No, we need to sleep, right? We can talk about this the next day, right? Or maybe you said the right words, but you said it in a text message. And you shouldn't have said it in a text message. You should have had the maturity to sit down across the table from that person face to face and say what needed to be said. Wisdom is knowing when to speak. Wisdom is knowing when to be quiet. Here's a novel concept. Just because you think it doesn't mean you need to say it, right? I just keep it real. I just say it. What I, no, you're, you're just being foolish. That's what it is. You're not keeping it real. You're a fool, right? I mean, I'm being honest this morning. Wisdom is when we're asking the Lord, God, I want to know how you would have me say what needs to be said. And I want to say it in truth, and I want to say it in love. For some of us, we have this misconception that as long as I'm right, I can say anything I want, however I want, and because I'm right, it doesn't matter if I'm a jerk. But what the Bible says is if you know all the mysteries of the world and you have not love, you are a resounding gong and a clanging cymbal. What does that mean? You may be right, but nobody cares because they can't hear you. Why? Because you have not love. You have not love. Paul also wrote in 1 Corinthians to not judge anything prematurely. To don't, not to judge something before the appointed time. And this is exactly what this church was doing. There was a misunderstanding there was a disappointment, and what were they doing? They were jumping to conclusions, and they were assuming motives, and they were allowing a story to build in their minds that was not accurate. How many of you know how easy it is for us to do this? <laughs> but what love is, according to the Bible, is love is where we don't keep a record of wrongs. Love means we, we don't find joy and unrighteousness. We bear all things, we hope all things, we believe all things. What does that mean? Listen, it means we don't assume the worst of people all the time. We assume good intentions until we see reason maybe to understand that maybe there's something else going on. But anytime that we do this, what these believers were doing, we can be assured that we're not walking from a place of love. And if we're not walking from a place of love, we're walking in rebellion against God. Let's look at this next part. Look, if you will, at verse five. We'll read from verse five to verse eight. If anyone has caused pain, he has caused pain, not so much to me, but to some degree, not to exaggerate, to all of you. This punishment by the majority is sufficient for that person. As a result, you should instead forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, he may be overwhelmed by excessive grief. Therefore, I urge you to reaffirm your love to him. So <clears throat> Paul is referring to a specific person within this church. He's not gonna name who this person is, but it's someone that um, apparently, as Paul mentions, everybody knows who it is. So it doesn't actually have to say his name. It's somebody who has caused this whole church pain. Caused pain to Paul, but Paul says not to exaggerate, he's caused pain to all of you. Now, who is this person? Well, 1 Corinthians 5 talks about a man that was living in sexual sin. And if you remember 1 Corinthians 5, Paul had written to this church and said, you need to cast this man out, deliver him to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Quite literally, he's saying, impose church discipline on this man by disfellowshipping him so he would repent and he would come back to the Lord. And so it could be that it's the same man from 1 Corinthians 5. Uh, some commentators think that it wasn't that man, maybe it was a different man, and maybe it was a man who was opposing Paul and stirring up division in the church. Uh, we're not quite sure, this unnamed person that Paul is referring to, but here's what we do know. Our sin does not just affect us. Paul says this person has caused everybody in the church to suffer. Do you know your sin affects the people that are connected to you? Your sin has an impact on your marriage. Did you know that? Your sin has an impact on your family. Your sin has an impact on your workplace. And your sin certainly has an impact and an effect on the body of Christ. 
So whoever this man was, he was placed under church discipline. That's what Paul means when he says punishment by the majority. But Paul says it worked. That discipline was sufficient. They had cast him out of the church. This man realized his sin. This man had repented. This man says, I was wrong. I don't wanna live that way anymore. I wanna be restored to fellowship. And Paul says, okay, now it's time to forgive this man and to restore this man. Easier said than done, right? (laughs) Oh, I talk to so many Christians that say, oh, we need to be people who are forgiving and full of grace and mercy and love. And yet... When that's somebody that's close to you, that's hurt you, how many of you know how hard that is? It's not easy to extend forgiveness to someone who has clearly been wrong and who has clearly wronged us. And I think the reason that so many of us Christians struggle with that in the day and age in which we live is because often our culture is discipling us more than the word of God is discipling us. And what our culture says about forgiveness often is what we think about forgiveness. And here's what our culture is saying about forgiveness right now. Our culture is saying that forgiveness is the same thing as weakness. So I don't know if you're paying attention to the culture around us. I think you should because you can see what's truth and what's lies. But we live in a culture that specializes in something called cancel culture. Have you heard of it? And what cancel culture is, is cancel culture in its essence is a culture that delights in the failures of those who have wronged us and refuses to extend any path of reconciliation back to that person who's wronged us. And we repaint our vengeance, resentment, and hatred for that person as justice. And so we don't say things like, okay, the marriage is broken. Let's figure it out. Let's figure it out. Let's figure out how to forgive. Let's figure out how to reconcile. We say say things like, well, they wronged you, so you get out of there. You don't have room for toxic people in your life. And so hatred, vengeance, villainizing someone, dehumanizing someone, that gets repainted as justice and reconciliation and forgiveness and Christ-like love. Those things are seen as signs of cowardice. And so many of us get discipled by the culture instead of being discipled and formed by the word of God. But listen, if you call yourself a Christian, meaning you have been formed and saved by Christ, that means you've got to be like Christ-like. Are you following me? So what has Christ done for you? Christ has willingly chosen to forgive you and reconcile with you. You were a God hater and you were a rebel until his redeeming grace came in and changed you from the inside out and you were moved from being an enemy of God to a child of God. Isn't that amazing? So that's happened for you. You know what Ephesians 4, 32 says? Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. You and I are the most Christ-like when we willingly choose to forgive and reconcile with those who have wronged us. Is that easy? (laughs) No, it's one of the hardest things we will do as believers. But it's what we're called to do. So this unnamed offender, he was sorry. He'd repented and now, Paul says, it's time for you to comfort him. It's time for you to welcome him back into fellowship. Otherwise, if you don't do that, he may become overwhelmed by excessive grief. What does it mean to become overwhelmed by excessive grief? Well, it means that when we shun somebody, we shame somebody, we make that person pay for their past sins without any road back to restoration. That can lead to us totally crushing them and pushing them away. Where they're so excessively grieved that, man, we can actually push them away from the God that we're trying to point them to. And that's a horrible thing when that happens. And so Paul is saying, listen, the stakes are high. You reaffirm your love to this person. Wrap your arms around this person. That's what he needs. You know, as Christians, we specialize at kicking people while they're down, don't we? And there comes a point in time where we need to be willing to offer the same forgiveness to that person, the same mercy to that person, the same grace to that person as God has given to us. Because at its core, when we refuse to do that, when we walk in unforgiveness, that's just a sign that we're not walking in love. But worse than that, it's an act of disobedience to God. James 2.8 talks about the royal law that we fulfill when we choose to show love to others. 
And if we're refusing to show love to other people because we're refusing to forgive them, then man, we're being disobedient to the law of God. And the stakes are high with this kind of thing. How many of you know that unforgiveness and resentment can tear apart families? I've walked into family gatherings and I didn't know who was mad at who, but I walked in the room and it was very clear that some people were not talking to other people. You've been in a family gathering like that? You go, I didn't know they were mad at this person. How long did they, well, did you not hear? They're not talking to, oh, who's, so this person's not talking to this person. They're connected to this person by default. And man, you could just split the tension of the room with a knife. It just feels so toxic and negative and awful. I've seen resentment and unforgiveness rip apart marriages. I sit down with a couple and they start talking to me about some of the stuff they've been walking in and I find out one of their hearts is so hardened against that other person. And it's an awful thing to see. I've seen it split apart friendships, decade-long friendships that get ripped apart because one person refuses to forgive. I remember being 10 years old, sitting in a business meeting at an old Baptist church, the hometown I was living in, and it was a members meeting where they were voting the pastor out. I remember seeing members get on a mic and the venom and the vitriol and the hatred in the faces of these men and women that claim to represent Christ. Left such an impression on me at 10 years old. I remember thinking, I never want to be a part of a church like that. Listen, if we are Jesus people, we gotta understand the greatest demonstration of love that we have ever received from God is his forgiveness towards us. That's how we know that God loves us, that he gave his only son. And if we're gonna love other people that God has called us, we have to be willing to demonstrate that same love and the way that we do it is through forgiveness. Let's keep going. Look, if you will, at verse nine. We'll read from verse nine to verse 11. I wrote for this purpose, to test your character, to see if you are obedient and everything. Anyone you forgive, I do too. For what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, it is for your benefit in the presence of Christ, so that we may not be taken advantage of by Satan. For we are not ignorant of his schemes. So one reason Paul had written this letter of correction and this letter of confrontation was to test to see if this church was gonna be obedient in the things that he had instructed them to do. Now, if you've read 1 Corinthians, Paul gave them some very, very, very important and at times probably very difficult instruction on how to deal with a person who was walking in sin and exercise church discipline on that person. And apparently they'd shown obedience and exercising church discipline. Now, some of us are more justice-oriented in how we view things, and so we read that and we go, yeah, truth, 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 good job, right, obedience, right? Well, are we gonna practice that same level of obedience in showing forgiveness when that person repents? See, forgiveness is just as much a matter of obedience to Jesus as anything else that he commanded. That's what he said to his disciples, a new commandment I give to you, love one another, and by loving one another, you will prove to all the world that you are my disciples by the way that you love one another. Some of us don't see love as a mandate. We see it as something that's optional. As long as I'm right, I can be as mean-spirited about anything I want, as long as I'm right, and that's just not true. That's just not true at all. And so the unnamed offender had sinned and he'd sinned against the church, but he had also sinned against Paul. And Paul said, I forgave him for your sake. Paul cared more about the fellowship and the unity of the Corinthian church than he did his own personal feelings or his own personal pride. Paul forgave this man and it wasn't just for his own benefit. He says it was for everybody's benefit. Did you know that when you choose to extend love, grace, and forgiveness, that has an influence and impact on everybody around you? that it creates an atmosphere within the church of love, grace, and forgiveness. It creates an atmosphere in your home of love, grace, and forgiveness, that in our homes, when we're showing each other love, grace, and forgiveness, that we give each other permission to be human and make a mistake every now and again. Isn't that a good thing? 
Man, I, I've talked, I'm trying to be real careful because I don't want to talk too much about sensitive topics, but I, I've met with people before and I've talked with people that tell me in the home I grew up in, I was never allowed to make one mistake. Everybody that made a mistake got crucified. So you know what they learned to do? Never admit that they were wrong and never apologize. And then 20 years later in their marriage, they're going, I, I don't know what the problem, I can never admit when I'm wrong and I can never apologize because I was never allowed to do that in the house I grew up in. That's a shame because there was someone who was already crucified for the mistakes that we make and his name's Jesus, right? So you can be honest when you make a mistake. You can be honest when you sin because there's love, there's grace and forgiveness and when we learn how to extend it to one another, it doesn't just influence us, it influences our children and our children's children and our children's 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 children, do you see? This is what Paul wants for these believers and Paul says, I did this in the presence of Christ. Jesus knows our every thought, or every word, or every deed, and we're gonna give an account to him for every thought, word, and deed. One of the reasons that Paul says that forgiveness and restoration and reconciliation are such a big deal within this church is because he says, I don't want Satan to take advantage of this situation. That's a very interesting verse, isn't it? Now, how would Satan take advantage of a situation like this? Well, Paul wrote in Ephesians 4, 26 through 27, that our sinful anger and resentment can lead to giving the devil a foothold in our lives. What does a foothold in our lives mean? A foothold is a strategic position from which an enemy attacks. It's like a beachhead that the enemy can go set up camp on that beachhead and from that beachhead can continue to assault and attack certain areas of our lives. And Paul said in Ephesians 4 that when we live in a place of resentment and anger, we willingly surrender an area of our lives over to Satan and say, camp out here and continue to attack me in my life from that place that I'm giving for you to set up to continually attack me. And Satan will take advantage of situations where we've been wronged and the reason that he often does that in our lives is he, he appeals to our own pride. He lies to us by telling us we're right in being offended, we're right in holding on to a grudge, because after all, they were wrong, they sinned against us, and so we're actually living for righteousness and truth if we hold on to a grudge and if we're offended. And you know why he does that? Because he hates you and has a terrible plan for your life. You know, we say, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. He does, isn't that great? Let's try this one on for size. Satan hates you and has a terrible plan for your life. I've never seen that cross-stitched at Hobby Lobby, but it's true, right? <laughs> and what's his plan? He wants to steal, he wants to kill, he wants to destroy. And what does he wanna do? He wants to steal your joy. He wants to steal your joy. I don't know if you know this or not, but people who dwell in places of unforgiveness tend to not be very joyful people. And the longer they stay in that place, the more nasty and discontented and offended they will be about everything. It's been said, we either age like milk or wine. And so if you don't get that right in your life now, and you get these habits of being offended by everything, you're gonna turn into milk. You ever been around a milky person, right? Like, moof, there's a smell, right? What is that? That person's character, right? It's true. <laughs> He wants to go after your peace. If you have a relationship in your life that's a blessing to you or that's a blessing to the people around you, he hates that relationship and he wants to steal the unity within that relationship. He hates unity in your marriage. He hates unity within the body of Christ. He hates any friendship or relationship that might be a blessing and point other people to truth in Christ. And so he's going after it. And that's one of his schemes but he also goes after it and takes advantage of those situations to use your unforgiveness to hurt and crush that other person because he wants to draw them away from the Lord. And Paul says we are not ignorant of his schemes. That we know what's happening, we know what's going on, we know that our adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour and he's put his bullseye on relationships. 
And he attacks us through unforgiveness and offense and resentment. And once our eyes are open to that and we start to recognize his schemes to destroy relationships, to gain a foothold in our lives, to try to divide the people of God, we understand this command to reconcile and forgive is essential. And it's a matter of spiritual warfare. Whether or not we will live in the victory that Christ has secured for us on the cross or whether or not we will surrender areas of our lives over to Satan. Now I'm gonna put this as simple as I know how to put it, but this is a very sobering truth for us and it's this. If you're holding on to unforgiveness this morning, if you're holding on to bitterness, if you're holding on to resentment, you are willingly allowing Satan a level of control and influence in your life. If you're wondering, man, I, I, don't have, I, I don't have joy, I don't have peace, my spiritual life just seems like I'm stuck in a rut, maybe go back and ask, is there an area of my life where I'm holding on to resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness? And if there is, we've just established where that foothold of the enemy is in your life. You don't have to give him that foothold, you have victory over him, but you're willingly doing that. And that's a scary place to be. Let's go on to this last part. Look at we will at verse 12, we'll read from verse 12 to the end of the chapter. When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though the Lord opened a door for me, I had no rest in my spirit because I did not find my brother Titus. Instead, I said goodbye to them and left for Macedonia. But thanks be to God who always leads us in Christ's triumphal procession and through us spreads the aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. For to God, we are the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To some, we are an aroma of death leading to death, but to others, an aroma of life leading to life. Who is adequate for these things? For we do not market the word of God for profit like so many. On the contrary, we speak with sincerity in Christ as from God, and before God. So Paul had been accused of being careless and sloppy and fleshly and reckless in how he made his ministry and his travel plans. And what Paul is doing at this point is he's assuring these believers that he'd been actually the opposite. He'd been very prayerful, thoughtful, and intentional in how he went about deciding where to go to do ministry. Paul's commitment to preaching the gospel had led him to a place called Troas, Troas is a city in Asia Minor, that's modern day Turkey. You can read about his ministry there in Acts chapter 16. And Paul wrote about God opening the door for him to preach the gospel there. And apparently, because Paul uses the language of an open door, God had blessed his work in the city of Troas. But even though there'd been an open door for Paul to do ministry in the city of Troas, he said that when he got there, he had no rest in his spirit. He had no peace of mind. Why is it he had no peace of mind? He had no rest in his spirit. Well, he sent Titus, his spiritual son, his ministry protege, to Corinth with a strongly worded letter. And the arrangements were, Titus, meet me in the city of Troas. We'll meet back up. You can give me a report on how the Corinthians are doing. But Titus doesn't arrive on schedule. So Paul says, I I didn't have any peace in my spirit. Meaning, I was worried about you because I wanted to know how things went when you got the letter. And he had no peace in his spirit. He, he was struggling with it. Even though God was blessing the ministry work in Troas, what Paul does is he decides he's gonna cut the ministry in Troas short to go to Macedonia to meet up with Titus. Why? So he can hear about the situation in Corinth and how those believers are doing. Now, why does Paul share this with these believers? It seems like his point in this is a couple of things. The first is he wants to tell them, guys, you mean so much to me that I actually ended a very fruitful season of ministry (coughs) in a different place for your sake to see how you were doing. So the accusations that I'm selfish and all that, no, man, I, I did this for you guys. That's how much I love you. That's how much I care about you. Uh, The second point for him mentioning this is perhaps maybe to show these believers just the scale of the responsibility that Paul had as a spiritual leader. You know, a a spiritual leader sometimes has to make very tough decisions. And at certain times, somebody told him this right when I went into pastoring, they said, as a pastor, sometimes it's a decision of who are you going to disappoint that day, right? I mean, at certain times, you're always going to let somebody down. 
Because if you say yes to going over here and meeting with this person, then you've gotta say no to speaking at that event or you gotta say no to being over here. And, then you, and, and Paul is just showing them, hey guys, it's not just about you guys in Corinth. There's all these other churches and all these other people that need me. And then really what Paul is saying is, listen, this isn't haphazard. This isn't reckless. It's, it's not my own whims or fancies or moods. I'm, I'm trying to be prayerful. I'm trying to be thoughtful. I'm trying to make decisions intentionally but at the end of the day, what Paul says is thanks be to God because it's God who is leading us. And God is leading us in Christ's triumphal procession. Paul wanted his critics to know that he was simply interested in following God, not whatever he wanted, but whatever God wanted. Listen, in following God and his direction for your life, there are gonna be some times when you take detours. <laughs> There's gonna be some times when you face disappointment and as you take detours or you face disappointment, those things might be very misunderstood by the people around you. But Paul is sure that God was in control, that Christ was victorious, and as long as he was following God in Christ's triumphal procession, everything was gonna be okay. Now, the language that Paul uses is taken from something called a Roman triumph. And uh, in Roman times, often when a conquering general would come back from war, they would come into a city uh, doing something called a Roman triumph. It was kind of like a ticker tape parade. And to earn this special honor, a conquering general would have had to defeat at least 5,000 enemies and have to gain new territory for the emperor. And so the general would come back into a Roman city. Their army would follow behind them. All these people would be lining the streets. There would be music. There would be cheering. There would be fragrant incense that filled the air. All the prisoners of war from the vanquished enemy would follow the conquering general. And Paul says, this is what it's like to follow Jesus. He's won a victory. And so we're following him in proclaiming the victory that he's won. And to those marching in the winning army behind the conquering general, as they smell the incense, as they hear the music and the cheering, the aroma of the presence of that general arriving, that's the smell of victory. But to the defeated prisoners of war who were conquered, they knew they were gonna be executed. That aroma of the triumph was the aroma of death. And Paul says, listen, it's kind of like that when we follow God. That the triumphal procession of Christ's victory on the move throughout planet Earth, he's already won the victory. We're following him, proclaiming that victory. And as we do, people are gonna smell the presence of Christ through us. And as they smell the presence of Christ on us and through us, it means very different things to different people. To Christians, to those whose hearts are soft and receptive to the gospel, the message of Jesus and the words of the gospel, um, it's like a sweet smelling perfume. Because they hear it and they go, oh, that means I can have victory over sin in my life. That means I can have victory over death. That means that I can live with God forever. That's beautiful news and it smells like victory. But to non-Christians and those who are still in bondage to sin and death, the message of Jesus, the word of the gospel, it's like the aroma of death. Because even though they'll never say it out loud, deep down they know that they're terrified of divine judgment. And so what Paul is doing is he's reminding us how we live, how we work, how we conduct ourselves as Christians, that's a matter of life and death to the lost world around us. And then he says, who's adequate for these things? Who's worthy for this great honor? The truth is nobody, right? You're not worthy for that. I'm not worthy of that. And yet God in his grace has invited you, has invited me to play a part in following Jesus and proclaiming his triumph. And because this is such an important message of life or death, Paul says we're to speak it with sincerity, with truthfulness before God as his message from God to humanity. We're not supposed to market it. I'm supposed to sell this message for profit as so many do. This is a, a dig at some of these super apostles there in the city of Corinth. Paul says, no, this is a message we speak with sincerity, with truthfulness. This is a matter of life or death. 
So in closing, the good news is this morning that Christ is victorious, amen? You don't fight for victory. You and I are called to live from victory. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, the truth is Christ has conquered sin. He's conquered death. He's conquered the dominion of Satan in our lives through his victory on the cross. Jesus cried out on that cross to tell us die. It is finished. It is paid in full. And Jesus is alive and Jesus is at work in the world around us. And have you know that Jesus is on the move throughout our world. It's really easy to get discouraged as we look at what's happening in the West. We see the decline of Christianity in the US and in countries in Europe. And I've talked to some people recently and say, it's just so discouraging and scary what's happening in the world today. Well, anytime um, you get discouraged or scared at what's happening in the world today, I wanna encourage you to pick up a publication called Voice of the Martyrs or to hear about the global church in the global south. I'm talking anything south of the equator, what's happening in South America, Southeast Asia, and in Africa. It may be declining here in the West because we've gotten so comfortable that we don't think we need God. But in places where people don't live under the delusion that because we're fat and happy and have television, we don't need God, the people that know they need him, you know what's happening? The gospel of Jesus Christ is exploding. You know why? Because Christ is in the move throughout our world. It's not a question of is he on the move. The question is, are you following him? He's on the move. Your job is to get as close to the general as you can and to follow him and proclaim his victory. And as you follow him, as you proclaim his victory, the closer you are to the general, the more like the general you're gonna smell. <laughs> that aroma of the incense should be on you. So much so that your presence in the world as a Christian should be noticeable. You know why? Because you're following the general really close. And people get around you and they go, I hope they don't really do that. I'm just saying spiritually, metaphorically. <laughs> and they go, wow, you, there's something different about you. But it means different things to different people, see? To some people, it means life. Some people, they, they get near you, they get around you, they see the way that you love people, they see the way that you talk about people, they see the hope you have, the joy you have, the peace you have, they see the life inside your eyes and there's something in you where they go, wait a second, you know Jesus. Have you ever had that experience to where you're in a group of people, you, you don't know anybody else and you start talking to somebody and you've never met them before, but there's something that's vaguely familiar as you talk with that person. You realize you've never met them before and then it comes to your mind and their mind that they're a follower of Jesus and you are too. What is that about? The same Holy Spirit that lives in you lives in them. And there's a way in which, spiritually speaking, you smell Jesus on them. <laughs> and they smell Jesus on you and you go, wow, that smells like life. That smells like victory. That smells like hope. But listen, some people are gonna smell Jesus on you. It doesn't smell like life, victory, and hope. You know what it smells like? Death. Because even though they won't ever say it out loud to you, there is something deeply within them that is terrified of dying and standing before God and giving an account for their lives. And the Bible says in Romans 1 that People know, but they don't want to know, so they suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And when they're around you and they see the holiness of God and the life of God in your eyes, there's something in them that says, I hate this person. But they don't hate you. Jesus says, if they hate you, no, they hated me first. You smell like death to them. So the question for us that's relevant to ask as we close this morning is, if I'm supposed to, smell like the general, is his incense is supposed to soak through my clothes and everybody that's around me, they're supposed to say, wow, you, you smell like Jesus. How's that going? Am I representing Jesus and his message accurately? And am I doing it sincerely? Can people tell by the way that I talk 
Can people tell by the way that I treat people? Can people tell by the way that I make people feel like a human being made in the image and likeness of God that God loves so much he sent his only son to die on their behalf? Can they tell by the way that I treat them that that's what I believe? Is my faith visible? Is my faith noticeable? Listen, for some of us, the reason it's not is because we're ignorant to the schemes of Satan and we have willingly taken a part of our lives and we've said, Satan, set up shop. Here's a foothold. Here's a beachhead. Set up shop. Attack. And we fall and pray to Satan's schemes. Now, those are strong words I just said. Some of you go, I've never done that willingly to Satan. Well, listen to me. Christ has given you victory. Victory over sin, death, victory over the domain of Satan in your life, when you surrendered your life fully to Christ, if you've done that. But if that's happened for you, and then you've turned around and said, I'm gonna be unforgiving to that person. I'm gonna hold on to resentment to that person. I'm gonna hold on to anger and offense and hatred. You have just taken an area of your life and you've said, Satan... You can have control. You have given him willingly a strategic victory in your life, thus falling prey to one of the oldest schemes in the book. So here's the question that matters as we close this morning. Am I holding on to any unforgiveness? And if I am... Why? You know, I can't answer that for you, but I know in my own life, when I've asked myself why, it's been because I think that I'm right in holding on unforgiveness. It's been because I see unforgiveness as being a person of justice and being a person that loves truth. And the reason I'm holding on unforgiveness is because I have a refined sense of justice. And if I forgive that person, I'm letting them off the hook. If I forgive that person, I'm condoning their sin. And nothing could be further from the truth. That's just a lie from Satan that he's trying to get me to believe. And really it comes down to this. Will I choose to obey Jesus in forgiving the people that have wronged me or will I not? I got serious about my faith in my mid-20s and right when I did, there was a member of my family that did something very, very hurtful and very selfish that didn't just hurt me but hurt a lot of other people in my family. And so we did what a lot of families do. We decided we we're gonna make that person pay and here's how we're gonna make that person pay because that person wouldn't apologize or didn't see themselves as wrong. We decided that we'd give them the old cold shoulder. We were gonna make them pay and here's how we're gonna starve them out by refusing to speak to them. And I felt like I was justified in so doing because that person was wrong and I was right. And one night as I was working my summer job, delivering pizzas in between teaching job, I got in my little Jeep Liberty and I, prayed a very dangerous prayer, which if you don't mean this prayer, you should never pray it. But I prayed it, and the prayer was this. God, speak to me tonight as I listen to your word. And I turned on my radio, and as soon as I did, there was a pastor on the radio who was preaching in Matthew 18 about the parable of the unforgiving servant. You heard this parable? The servant who's forgiven an insurmountable amount of debt and as he's forgiven that debt, he goes and he finds somebody that owes him five bucks and he chokes the guy out and says, go to debtor's prison until I get my five bucks back. And I prayed, Lord, speak to me tonight. I wanna hear from you tonight. I wanna walk with you, Jesus. I wanna follow you, Jesus. And then Jesus points me to his words in Matthew 18. You know what I did? <laughs> I turned off the radio. <laughs> and then I felt the Lord say to me, just in that still small voice, and I hear his audible voice, I just felt in my, my heart, God say something like, you asked me to speak to you and I did. If you want me to speak to you, you gotta be obedient with what I have spoken to you. One of the most difficult phone calls ever made was that night. Picking up the phone right then, calling this person and said, I forgive you. I'm sorry for the resentment I've had towards you and the bitterness I've had towards you. I love you and I want you to be a part of my life. 
Listen, that, that was 15 years ago and I, I, don't, I don't know what my life would have been like and the blessings I would have robbed just not myself but my future children of had I not chosen that moment to choose the path of obedience to Jesus. It's a matter of life and death, don't you see? His way is better. I ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. We're gonna go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father God, all across this room, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. Lord, some of us, we're stuck in a place of darkness. The darkness of resentment, the darkness of anger, the darkness of hatred, bitterness. But in the midst of that darkness, your word is a lamp to our feet and a light for our path. As your word shows up in that dark place and says, this is the road, walk ye in it. Here's the path out of the darkness. It's not easy. It's a narrow road, but it's the road that leads to life. So Lord, I pray for any of us that are stuck in that place, that we would picture Jesus standing before us just like he did at that crippled man by that pool that we read about in John's gospel looking at us and saying, do you wanna be healed? And Lord, if we truly do want your healing in that area of our life, if we truly do want reconciliation in that relationship, if we truly do want freedom and peace and joy, I pray that we would listen to the voice of our healer that says, take up your mat and walk. Make the phone call. Ask for the coffee meeting, have the conversation, extend forgiveness, show mercy, show love. Mercy triumphs over judgment. I pray God that we would release the hatred, we'd release the bitterness. Give us what we need to be like Jesus, just as we sang earlier, Lord, Make us more like Jesus. And help us as we follow behind our great commander to, to have the fragrance of Christ all around us that when people are near us and around us, they, they smell Jesus on us. And Lord, let it be that sweet smell of life and victory as we follow you throughout the world. We love you, we praise you, we bless you. We pray all this in the mighty name of Jesus, in Jesus' name, amen.